what is up everybody today I'm back with another video and this one is gonna be a little bit interesting so I want to talk here about some of these arguments that I found and they're gonna be in Aquinas's writing specifically his he's got a short treatise called against the errors of the unbelievers and what I want to do today is just go over a couple of the arguments two or three that he gives in chapter 5 and I titled the video, Why Christ is So Important for the Christian Religion. And oftentimes when you hear about the person of Christ, you just hear about this whole idea of salvation and how Jesus died for your sins and all this stuff that I'm sure you have all heard, you don't quite grasp, and sometimes you find it rather cringy. And I've definitely felt that. You can see that a lot of times when street preachers are just screaming, oh, you need to repent and Christ will save you, and you don't really know what that means. Now, that's a topic for a, another video and specifically more in Christology, but what I want to do today is really point out some rather profound and I think moving reasons why Christ, the person of Christ, is so important for the Christian tradition. And I guarantee you, you probably have not heard these before. And if you have, you definitely have not heard them from Twitter or social media or anything in the modern era, because these are really old ideas that you find a lot in the Church Fathers and in Aquinas. And it seems, in my experience at least, that they've kind of gone and fallen out of fashion. But I hope that this video can help you to understand them and to kind of think about them, get your mind thinking about these things, and really to maybe move you in the direction toward the Christian faith. So let's get into this. So really Aquinas gives this kind of interesting argument in chapter 5 and he's arguing for the incarnation or Jesus becoming man or God, God I should say, God, Jesus, because they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're the same. The Logos, you could even say, becoming man, becoming incarnate in man, taking on a human nature in addition to his divine nature. And Aquinas says this, he says, this is my interpretation or paraphrase of the argument. He says this, he says, the way of restoring something should correspond to the nature being restored and the sickness it is seeking to remedy. So you can think about this in terms of medicine. The way of restoring some sort of illness should correspond to the nature being restored. So if the restoration is of a human nature, then the medicine should be probably prescribed by a human doctor who understands the human body and it should be aimed at the human nature and not an animal nature or a plant nature. You know, you wouldn't use fertilizer or some sort of remedy for plants on a human. And it should be correspond to this sickness that it is seeking to remedy. So cancer would be a great example. Chemotherapy, the sickness is grave and also the treatment of it is going to be grave in order to get rid of that. So this is Aquinas' operating principle here. You can try to think about other examples on your own. But then he goes on to say this. Well, if you accept this principle, you have good reason for believing that Jesus or God became man. And the reason is this. Our nature is that which is being restored. And our sickness is a sickness of the way that our will is ordered. Meaning that our will is sickened by being improperly ordered to an end. You know, we are ordered toward, because of original sin, we are not ordered toward God anymore. We are, in fact, often a slave to our passions. And we, as Paul says, do, in fact, what we do not want to do all the time. And so, according to this operating principle that the way of restoring should correspond to the nature being restored and the sickness it is seeking to remedy, the way of restoring our condition, our human condition, should correspond to our nature, which is being restored, and the sickness, our perversity of our will, that is being remedied. And so it follows then that the way of restoration would then take on our human nature or somehow be related to our human nature. And also it would seek to remedy or be related in some sort of intimate way to our perverse will. And so it is not obviously an airtight deductive argument, but it does get you to a solid, I think, inductive case for the incarnation. Meaning that our restoration, the way of our being restored, would have some sort of very intimate connection with our own human nature, such as the person of Christ taking on our human nature, and also 
our improperly ordered or perverse will, meaning Christ taking on our human nature and living a life that is perfectly ordered toward God, the way that our will is supposed to be ordered. And this is, in fact, why Aquinas thinks that Christ became man, or one of the reasons why Aquinas thinks Christ became man. So I think that this is actually quite interesting to think about. And you can also think about one last thing I'll mention that I, I didn't before is that God really then, according to this argument, took on man's nature and remedied our perverse will by ordering it toward, or in, in his own life, ordering it toward God through love. And that's also a common, common thing that runs throughout Aquinas' work here is this idea of love. Obviously, this argument raises a ton of questions like whether or not you're going to accept this principle, how this could even work, how this remedy would fix us, etc. But think about that. I think it's an interesting argument. So here are, again, I'm going to go through two more. He gives four or five, depending on how you cash them out, but I'm just going to give you two more. So argument two here. If you accept that God cares about us and deeply loves us, then it seems quite plausible that the incarnation would occur. So think about this. Because, or think about this, um, let, me, let me rephrase it differently. In being loved, we love. So think about how if somebody loves you in a genuine fashion, okay, we can have a whole conversation about what love is. I'm not talking about the person who is like your stalker, who is sycophantically fetishizing or obsessing over you. No, no, no. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a genuine, either erotic or familial or agape type love. Um, in being loved, you express love as well. I think this is, a pro this is probably true. And so Aquinas starts out with this principle and he says, in being loved, we love. And there is no greater way to, for someone to showcase their love for us than for Christ to become man for our salvation. This um, seems to follow from the Christian idea that laying down your life is the greatest form of love. And so really what this gets you to is kind of an argument like this. In being loved, we love. Christ showcases his amazing love or God showcases his amazing love for us in becoming man and in becoming man he demonstrates with great great clarity and with great power that he loves us and so following from that first principle it would follow that in the inc because of the incarnation we notice how greatly loved we are and we then love God in return and this argument then when you combine it with a further principle that states that God does deeply care about us and wants us to love him because that is in fact our greatest fulfillment, our greatest treasure, our final end, well, what you get is a perfect argument or seemingly perfect argument that would then seem to demonstrate a quite plausible, or a, the plausibility of the incarnation. So let me tie it all together one more time because this can be quite confusing. In being loved, we, in fact, love. Christ showcases how much, or Christ or God, again, keep in mind, Trinity, same. Christ or God showcases how much he loves us in the incarnation. Okay? Christ showcases how much he loves us in the incarnation. And this then draws us closer to him. And because God does want us to draw closer to him because that is our, our greatest treasure and that is really what is going to fulfill us the most, he would in fact then do something like the incarnation and be, become a man. I think that this is quite an interesting argument. Somebody could try to object saying that it's circular reasoning, but I'm not using the incarnation in the same sense in the premises. I'm, I'm, I'm using a, a, a hypothetical in the premise in order to prove in the conclusion the incarnation is possible. So you can think about this and you can try to write it out and wrestle with that on your own, but the basic idea seems to be that the incarnation is this great symbol of love. And in fact, in noticing that we draw closer to God and God wants us to draw closer to him, so it would in fact be plausible that he became incarnate. And you can make this kind of tighter formally in logic by assuming the hypothetical nature of the incarnation in the premise 
and then deducing its actual existence with a probability in the conclusion. So don't worry about that circular reasoning objection. I just kind of thought about that when I was, I was rehearsing the argument in my head. I don't want anybody to raise that in the comments. Um, so let me give you this last one. And this I think is actually one of the most interesting ones that I have ever heard. So it goes something like this. It's easier for man to love another man than to love ideas or spiritual things. I think this is true. It's easier for us to love another person or to love some sort of object uh, like our car or our garden or maybe even our pets. It's easier to love those things than it is to love, say, some sort of imaginary thing like a person in a novel or some sort of intellectual thing like mathematics or even some sort of spiritual thing like your patron saint or maybe even God. And this is quite interesting to think about. And I think that this has to do with the nature, the physical nature that, is, that is involved in love. You know, there's a famous story about a nun and a priest. It was written down. I can't remember where, but it's, it's, it's somewhere out there. I could, if you want to ask in the comments, I could probably find it and leave it. Where they were deeply in love with each other, but because of their vows, they couldn't have any physical contact. And both of them said that there was something deeply missing about their love, even though they really became close together. There was some sort of physical component missing. And so I think this points to the notion that a physical connection is really going to be important in love. And unfortunately, this may, I think this is true for most people. Some people, again, may, may, have it, may have an easier time grasping and loving intellectual and spiritual things, but I think for most of us, we need some sort of physical um, component. And so Aquinas says that in order then to lift up all people to loving him, because again, that is our final end, our greatest good. My dog's running around here. She just came in for a walk. But in order to lift up all people to their final end or their greatest good, their greatest treasure, the thing that will deeply satisfy them the most, and that is in this loving union with God, in order to do that, it's fitting that God became man. Because in becoming man, we have a much more closer physical connection to God than we would do if he was just some sort of intellectual idea or spiritual thing. And I think that this is actually quite a powerful argument. If you accept the claim that God does in fact love us deeply, care about us, and wants us to be fulfilled and come to our, our greatest treasure, which is him, then he will recognize that a lot of people really struggle to connect with spiritual and abstract things. And in fact, they need some sort of physical component to their love. And that is in fact why he became man, is to give those people a much deeper physical connection in the person of Christ. Seeing how Christ walked among us, took on flesh and became one of us, took on our perverse human nature and elevated that in dignity to something even above the angels. I think this is quite a beautiful argument and it coincides well with a lot of things that what Origen says about Christ taking on, you know, becoming a baby and having to be raised and really showcasing how he cares deeply about us and would become physical to give us really a model for love and for, for God. And so I think that this, this argument is, is quite, quite interesting. So that's just three arguments Aquinas gives in this really short work. There's so much more packed into it. But I think what it shows you is that Christ is playing a much more deeper, much more mysterious role in the Christian religion than is often presented by a lot of people and uh, often not realized. He is, you know, really not only a paradigmatic model that brings us deeper in love to God through some sort of physical connection, or at least a stronger physical connection than simply one with a spiritual and intellectual thing, maybe in Islam or Judaism or something like that, but he also is our restorative. He, he, is, he is restoring us in a unique way. And in fact, he is showcasing his love for us, which in showing how much he loves us, draws us closer to our final end, our greatest, the greatest thing about our existence and our nature, which is in fact participation in the Godhead through a deification process and seeing the beatific vision. So again, 
I think this actually seems to me to be one of the prime reasons why Christianity is superior in in its account of religion and its, its worldview than say Islam, Judaism, or even paganism. Um, it's a lot more it's a lot more rich and beautiful in one sense, and it also seems to make sense of our human condition and speaks to the heart even more. Paganism can be kind of cold and impersonal, and you get a lot of theurg theurgic rituals and practices that don't draw you closer to God or the One, and don't speak to that yearning for physical contact that you have and embedded seemingly in your nature and in your nature in the nature of love. And it really gets it, it, this this account, this Christo Christology, this person of Christ, really I think edges out Judaism and Islam because. On those religions, I'm pretty sure that, that God does deeply care about you and love you, but it would seem that that love and deep care doesn't go far enough on those two accounts of religion. Um, and, and Christianity really seems to me to be the only religion on which God's love is expressed in its fullest manifold. Um, so you can think about that on your own. Feel free to disagree with me. You know, everybody is on their own journey, struggling, tearing with these intellectual ideas. But I hope that what this video did was show you that the person of Christ is extremely, extremely mysterious, deep, and his, his, um, he, who he is is very, very powerful and can really touch the hearts of people and bring them closer to the greatest treasure that we can imagine, which is participation in the divine Godhead and deification and union with God sharing in that beautiful majesty. So thanks for watching and feel free to like, subscribe, comment, and I'll be sure to get out some more videos.